Okay, Carrie and Patrick, I'll let yeah. you guys uh, take over the show. Okay, thank you, Wynn. Yeah, so we're, we're here to discuss uh, AI and some other technologies and financial services. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I think we'll just go ahead and get started and let the Yeah, maybe we just let everybody themselves. introduce yep. themselves. Start, Start with Michelle. Hi, I'm Michelle Ranieri. I'm Vice President of Analytics and Business Development with Experian. And I lead teams of consultants and statisticians and scientists who work with our data to help lenders um, make better decisions and uh, develop strategies. I am David Ferber. I'm our solutions delivery leader for our uh, data analytics organization at Equifax. Uh, I've been there for 20, almost 25 years, uh, mostly in IT and uh, in the credit side for the US. I am uh, Pablo Abreu, I'm the head of data science at Secure. We are a real-time identity verification API. Um, currently lead both the R&D as well as the client-facing um, data science. Hi, uh, my name is Donald Jeniton. I'm a data engineer at Capital One. Hey, I'm Rahul Gupta. I'm with uh, Capital One as well, a data engineer for our Center for Machine Learning. Hi, I'm Nikhil Nayib. I lead uh, blockchain practice development within capital markets for Accenture. Okay. Thank you guys so much for joining us. We, Carrie was saying earlier, we have a lot of brain power on the stage. So we're going to ask some questions to get things started off, and then uh, hopefully we'll be able to get some audience feedback to, to finish it up. Great. Okay. So we'll, we'll start with our first question. Um, why do you guys think that building a strong machine learning function is important in a financial services organization? And if you could share you know, any key lessons, what, if you feel like you've been successful in that path, uh, what lessons would you share with the audience? Pablo, I'll throw it to you. You seem to have an answer. Sure. So. Um why? Uh, I'll say that it creates a frictionless experience for the customer. Uh, there's a lot of value added there. Uh, the other thing is that it allows uh, to increase revenue while also minimizing some of the cost. Okay. Yeah. Okay. In, in, in terms as to what are some of the things that I've seen in the financial is, is really focusing on the data and allowing the data to commingle between groups. Okay, cool. Um, and so I'd say one other thing that uh, I've seen and, and appreciate is that you know, in, in the credit industry, that data has been around for a long time. It hasn't changed a whole lot, what data is available. And so the financial services industry has gotten the most they can using traditional methods. So I think machine learning is allowing them to get more out of that data than they have in the past as well as uh, able to look at it over a long period of time and using that as another, another dimension to to get more out of a, a data, data set that's, that's, like I said, hasn't changed in so long. Cool, okay. Anybody else wanna add? Feel free. Yeah, yeah you know, I think if you, you know, within capital markets, within sort of like trading systems development, et cetera, you know, things change quite dramatically year over year. And, you know, if you dial back since 2008, we haven't seen a, you know, sort of influx in equities trading for a while, for quite some time, right? But however, you know, because it's an area that the, bank, the banks have divested from, you end up losing a lot of the knowledge. So from my perspective, I think you know, if you can institutionalize some of that knowledge, you, know, you will be able to sort of like redirect and reallocate your resources and capital a lot more efficiently as your business priorities shift year over year. So I think you know, that, that has an interesting role to play in it. Cool. Okay. Great answers, great answers. You wanna, you wanna ask one? Sure, so we, we've heard a lot today, starting with Shree's keynote about the democratization of data and how that's really gonna play an important role as we move forward with predictive analytics. Anyone care to comment on that? So in terms of democratization of data, I think that one of the things that's um, happened in the last five or seven years has been uh, this development of data sets that are displaying all of the data that the credit bureaus have. And before, you used to have to be really specific in what you wanted to pull, how you got retrospective data, and didn't have a real analytical sandbox or a playground that you could go in and use the data. And so now the technology is there in order to have 100% um, file that's on the, on available to our clients and to lenders. Um, I think you probably heard about Equifax's Ignite earlier, and so we have also Ascend, which is 100% of the database. 
available. But on top of that, our clients, I mean, lenders have asked for H2O specifically. So having that combination of the technology and the learnings and the AI available to them, I think is making a big difference to the democratization and, and putting it in all of the lenders' hands, whether it's an analyst or a scientist or an executive who wants to have visualization and, and benchmarking, that it's really making a difference. Cool, thanks. Yeah, I think one thing to add to that too is just, I think from a customer perspective, having that transparency, especially when you're talking about people's money and, and their investments, they wanna feel comfortable about it and know what's happening. Um, and by adding that you know, democratization of, of the data, I think they get that, that better than they had previously. Nice. Okay. Anybody else want to chime in or we can move on to the next question? All right. Let's keep it moving. Um, all right. So democratization of data, big theme. What, uh, what other technologies, applications, we can open it up to broader than machine learning, but, you know, ideally, what are the most sort of transformative or impactful applications of use cases or, I'm sorry, of machine learning or other new technologies have you guys seen or can you comment on? Sure, I'll, um, I'll add uh, that um, at, at Secure, we've tested a lot of machine learning app, uh, applications and softwares, and it's, it's fair to say that uh, the industry transformed a bit from being a black box into being more transparent, and I think H2O is, is, is leading that transformation. Okay, cool, thank you, thank you. Any other uh, like impactful use cases of machine learning you guys want to talk about? I, I know. It, I know. Yeah. <laughs> I mentioned it a little earlier the uh, trended data uh, view and looking at longitudinal data across time. Uh, I see a lot of our clients getting value out of that and finding things that they didn't see before. Uh, but you know, understanding customer journey and, and other things about next best product, next, next best offer, right place, right time, those types of scenarios. Uh, I see a lot of focus on that and uh, continuing growing, uh, getting more knowledge about the, their clients. Okay. And, how to, how to better target them. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, please, please. You know, I think uh, the only thing I'd add is, you know, markets and trading effectively has been doing this stuff for quite some time, mm -hmm. right? But, you know, with platforms like H2O, you can truly, you know, essentially have these models shared across, you know, different organizational boundaries. So instead of, you know, I think of a use case where instead of compliance saying no to a particular trade based on the way it's structured, if you can actually share what is it that drives those decisions, compliance can actually come back and say, yeah, but if you do this long call differently or change the tenor on this one, it passes risk parameters. So actually, you know, you can empower organize the organization to actually make better decisions that result in better revenues, you know, through platforms such as such as H2O. Okay. Okay. So you, Nikhil, hit on something that we're very interested in H2O. We know other people in the financial services vertical are also interested in it. Um, for a long time, it's been understood that nonlinear models can give potentially more accurate answers in, in different use cases than linear models. But the problem is, how do I explain these decisions, right? And uh, so if you guys maybe kind of from the opposite side, can you talk about some of the challenges that you've seen around trying to use machine learning in this space? So we know that one is regulatory, you know, one is compliance. It's hard to explain how these things work. Um, another one I've seen is when these machine learning models get very complicated, they become hard to deploy. I'm sure that data engineers might know a little bit about that. Sorry. Okay. Any, any comments about challenges? Yeah, so I can, I can go into a little bit more detail about the regulatory challenges. Um, specifically around decisioning for consumers. So that's when somebody is accepted or mostly declined for credit or if their pricing is changed because of something that is revealed through a model or a low score. And that um, the reason is that it, uh, it has to be disputable by the consumer. You have to be able to show the consumer basically why their score went down or why they were declined and that way they can take a look at their credit report and determine whether or not they want to dispute something because they think that it's not exactly accurate. So that's one part of it. The other part is around fair lending and that if there is a protected class that is being um, disenfranchised, even if it is not intentional, that that's something that a regulator is looking for in terms of fair lending. And so all of that is really around the decisioning aspect of consumer credit as opposed to 
say, fraud or collections or loss mitigate, uh, uh, loan loss reserves and capital adequacy. So there's a lot of areas that, that you can still use machine learning and AI, but you're not able to for right now for something that's um, the, the risk determinant at the time of decisioning. And, and that's something that's mm -hmm. still being worked out. I, I anticipate it's going to be worked We're working out. on it. Exactly. <laughs> Everybody is. Yes. Everyone is. So, yeah, and to add to that, you know, we've been focused on trying to develop that capability mm -hmm. where you can leverage those machine learning models and produce those adverse action codes that the regulatory bodies uh, require. And so at Equifax, we developed in patenting uh, a neurodecisioning technology, which does uh, have a math that will allow you to um, go back and figure out what are those reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, and I see that as a, as a trend, and, and I look at uh, a lot of the companies are, are, how, how, are figuring out how they can get to that. So you know, uh, neurodecisioning is one example of that, and, um, uh, you know, and, and hopefully working with H2O, we'll be able to uh, see more of that because you are going to get better customer experience and the consumers are going to be benefiting from these models because you're going to get more people access to credit, uh, more access to things they weren't tr traditionally able to get to because of the lack of data and the lack of math and science to, to make better decisions. Yeah. So I think that's going to you're going to see an open, uh, more open uh, market because of because okay. of these tools. Yeah. Okay, I'd I'd love to hear from the data engineers about just getting stuff in the right place and how hard that is. Yeah, so from our side, I um, was going to touch on in terms of tr kind of your executive summary, if you're trying to actually get buy-in and, and say how this model is what you're trying to get across, um, and you start including things like hidden layers, and, and if someone's not familiar with a model and you're kind of even throwing out those terms, you can very easily lose someone, and they may want to stick with tr traditional ways of going about it, whereas even something like an H2O where you can get your variable or your feature importance and get you know relative importance and show this is this factor is you know, 10 times more important, um, even at kind of a summary level. It's a lot easier to be able to say, this is why we want to use this model, mm -hmm. this is how we're able to tune it. Um, and, and from there, once you get your buy-in at a higher level, it's easier to go forward. Okay, great. Yeah, well, go. Yeah, and, yeah, and one thing that I would add, um, you know, <clears throat> I've always heard that in banking, you know, there's, there's elements of humanity, and I think this is very transferable to um, AI, but, you know, there's, there's a few things that you don't ever want to mess with with somebody you know it's your friends your family and your money mm -hmm. so in banking you kind of have if you're not working with somebody's money chances are you're working with a, a friend or a family yeah. member so I think being able to explain the results of a, a of a model is one thing but being able to do so in a in a in a highly human way is okay. important because okay. that's that's your that's your success right yeah Yep, so, so, so I'll add that some of the challenges are around creating the recent codes um, to explain the model, why does the score is higher versus lower, but also is on understanding what should be properly documented. So when we talk about model governance, we should clearly emphasize like what is the purpose of the model, what is the framework, and when we talk about the framework, we should document specifically what are the hyperparameters. What, are, what, what does this hyperparameter mean to have a higher number of trees versus lower? And I'm, I'm seeing already that uh, at a financial institution, the model oversight uh, teams are educating themselves around machine learning, which mm -hmm. is helping more. Okay, great. I think we're seeing the convergence of a lot of different technologies. So I don't know, um, Nikhil, I'll, I'll start with you on this one. Can you talk a little bit about uh, artificial intelligence and now the emergence of blockchain and how that will be used in your vision with machine learning in the, in the future state? Yeah, that's, you know, that's interesting because if you think about you know, blockchain, it's definitely a collection of technologies, right? But, uh, but at the top of that sort of technology funnel is, is standardization. And you know, for you to interact on a seamless ecosystem where cash moves instantly, money moves instantly, the definition of all of these assets need to be needs to be standardized, whether it's a loan, whether it's you know a securities settlement. Um, so I think you know what will end up happening is that you just will end up getting you know better quality, cleaner data to feed mm -hmm. you know an AI ML engine. That's tremendously um, important. I think that will just cause this thing to just be a lot more usable, a lot faster. That's sort of like one one sort of axis, and the other one is where it starts getting really fuzzy because. Um, this is sort of like you know 
blockchain space, private blockchain space, but when you think about Bitcoin and all the different Bitcoin exchanges, they're actually money services businesses. And they are under the same sort of like KYC, AML, PEP screening, et cetera, et cetera. They need to do all of those. Well, how do you do that? They are actually deploying machine learning algorithms to figure out whether people who are using these crypto addresses have interacted with the dark web. And they scan the internet, mm -hmm. use ML algorithms to figure out whether this website is actually selling opioids or whether it's actually drugs or I mean medicines. Mm -hmm. So differentiating all of that, bringing that intelligence into a machine and making decisions on whether a particular Bitcoin transfer should be allowed to go out or not is, is, a, is a really interesting kind of problem that they're, they're, they're solving today. Okay. I, I have to say that that meshes exactly with the limited experience I've had with blockchain, working with some of our customers in financial services. Um, I think for the audience, you know, when I, when I found out I needed to be a little educated about blockchain for this panel, you know, I just went to YouTube and started watching videos at 1.5x speed. But I feel like if, <laughs> if you could share you know, how, some, some better pointers about how to learn about blockchain and Bitcoin with the audience, I think that would be really appreciated. OK. Uh, <laughs> what, where, like, where would you go to learn about it? What, you know, I, I think um, you know, it's, it's really sort of like doing stuff and you know, coding stuff, much like you would probably end up learning H2O, okay. <clears throat> which is sort of you, you have to kind of try this stuff out. And there's a lot that's been written uh, today. And there's a lot of open source projects that are fantastic ways of getting started with the blockchain ecosystem. You know, to be honest, um, until you write some of that code yourself, Okay. Until you experience it, it's very difficult to articulate your business in a manner that, or your technology in a manner the business can understand, or the other way around. So I think you know a fantastic <clears throat> place to get started is either the Hyperledger Foundation okay. or the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance. These are two you know sort of tremendous open source projects uh, that have you know amazing sort of uh, work that's going on into them. Um, and then you know you have sort of private permission blockchain ledgers like Corda, et cetera, uh, that are purpose-built for financial services. So you know, Accenture actually has a sort of, uh, you know, essentially a, a statement that we are agnostic to the various different platforms. I work with a lot of them, and there's just a lot to learn. OK, cool. So um, as many of you probably know, and, and financial services, and that's where I first learned this, you know, data, data science is not new, right? We, we can't help that in 2006, you know, someone famous at, at Facebook said, oh, now, you know, now this thing that you guys have been doing for 40 years is now called data science. Um, so I think there's pressure in financial services to start showing return on investment, right? Practicing data science is not cheap, or practicing analytics is not cheap. And so can you comment, or have you seen any ways you know, I, I feel like in financial services, especially like the, the newness of all this is, has really worn off, right? And executives want to see how does this model make money? How does this process save money? Can you guys talk about any experience you've, you've had in measuring ROI or plans you may have for measuring ROI of, of machine learning projects or analytics projects? Yeah, so, so I'll add that uh, Secure so were a machine learning based company. I, I feel that this year that we've been able to create a lot of the automation around the machine learning and, and data science, we've been able to boost our revenue tremendously. And that has allowed us to start scaling, uh, which is one of the big issues, right? You, you can't really have or hire 20 data scientists. And so the, the next step in data science is what do you do with the minimum headcounts that you have to be able to scale and grow your revenue to a mm -hmm. point in where the executives will open their eyes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say that one of the, one of the biggest expenses in banking is, is fraud, right? So if you're going to implement machine learning and you do so on fraud, you should be able to measure that pretty precisely. OK. I mean, okay. be simple and straightforward. Okay. I would say at, uh, at Equifax, we do a, a process called new product innovation. Um, and as machine learning uh, models or data products get built and delivered, we use that, that process to, to measure uh, re return on investment. I don't know how it translates specifically down to the data scientists that we have, but I do know uh, you know, we kind of bifurcate uh, the groups into revenue generating, mm -hmm. very specific, very tactical goals. 
and then this innovation group, right? The data scientists in that group are thinking years ahead and coming up with uh, things that may not be monetized for several years. And we know that, and it's acceptable, uh, but it's that investment we're, we're willing to make. Can, can you, David, or, or anybody else comment on, like, what, what is a good balance between having, you know, a, a group of people basically doing science projects, thinking way out into the future, and then having a, another probably larger group of people doing things that you know are gonna are gonna return you know return savings return profit return revenue. I'll say that one of the things that I've done at at, at Tokyo is really uh, split the team between uh, data scientists that are gonna be client facing that are gonna be building models, while having uh, even split uh, research and development between res the R and D that's gonna support the application versus the guys that are gonna focus on the innovation side. And this allows me to quantify, hey, by the way, we're still delivering on the business KPIs, but here I have some headcounts that will push through the innovation, and so we can uh, justify uh, having those guys when we don't see revenue right, right away from them. Okay. So I know, for me personally, um, we have been trying to shift more, so data engineers get into the machine learning space, the data scientists are trying to get more full stack experience as well. So being able to round that out, um, and also just having that curiosity, which I think is just kind of a quality for a good engineer or da data scientist, um, and reading you know academic papers about new things coming out, or new ways, uh, new techniques, um, is really one of the best ways to do it. So you don't necessarily need to have you know those 20 or 30 people. You can just have a more robust engineer or data scientist who just kind of you know can capture a few more of those those fields there. Yeah, I'd say one of the big challenges we've run into too is the talent pool, right? They're mm -hmm. finding the talent out there uh, and looking at different industries. Maybe they're not financial services savvy, but they have really good backgrounds in solving problems and bringing them in, and kind of a fresh perspective on things. So. Uh, I, I like having that mix of experienced vertical experts in those industries and then people that just are smart but maybe have you know, a whole new a fresh perspective. Okay. So, yeah, so that's a yeah, I just think you know, both of your questions, you know, the one on ROI and, and then this one, they're sort of all interrelated, right? Is yeah. there a perfect sort of you know, ratio between how many heads you have in a lab versus how many you know, doing real work? You absolutely don't. You know, the only thing you can probably make sure is that whatever happens in labs is actually driven by the business, Nice, right? Uh, 10 or 100, it doesn't really matter mm -hmm. if they're actually solving a real business problem. I think that's, that's one part. And then, you know, generally speaking, within at least bank, within capital markets on, on sort of like the trading side, um, you know, after the financial crisis, right, the focus was on meeting all kinds of capital adequacy ratios. And as a result of that, what the banks really got a great handle on is understanding their cost of capital, but more importantly, desks allocating that cost of capital right down to the desk. Because otherwise, how do you know what's a profitable business and how do you know what needs to be shut down or not? Because mm -hmm. this isn't you know, free money that was available or you know, essentially super levered money that was available before 2008, right? So they have actually spent a lot of time trying to figure those models out. And as a result of that, you know, any, you know, once you strip away infrastructure cost, server storage, et cetera, um, it's, it, it has become sort of very reasonably easy to quantify the ROI from efforts such as ML, the futuristic mm -hmm. efforts such as ML. Okay. So I think they're all kind of interrelated. They all yeah, they play are. together really well. So let me, let me ask, oh, did you want, you had a comment, Michelle? Yeah, the, um, I think it's important also to recognize that some of that may not be quantifiable, mm, that that ROI okay. may not be there, but that my perspective for Experian, we have the same basic setup of a very long-term science group, an operations group, and a short-term kind of skunk, skunk works and, um, and client-facing group. And um, what I see with what we call the LAD, the longer-term scientists, are that they're, they're raising the bar and raising the water level for the entire industry. And so by having, um, having ideas that come from other parts of, of other industries and that are working in the ML AI space, it really is challenging. It's challenging to our clients, to the lenders, to the regulators, and our main objective is to do the best that we can for consumers. And so if that ultimately results in something that extends credit and provides better and more accurate 
um, assessment of risk for a consumer, then that's why we do it. And, and the traditional ways are old, and some of them have been around for decades, so it's been largely the lab that has really pushed our, our comfort levels. Okay, cool. So I'm gonna, maybe we'll do two more questions up here and then try to get some audience involvement, so start thinking about your questions. Um, okay, so, so I'm, yeah, all these questions are interrelated. I'm gonna ask the, the final you know, sort of question in this, this uh, sequence of almost leading questions. Um, at this conference, you, you probably noticed H2O is betting heavily on automation. And um, I, think, I think one reason is, is because we feel it's a way to drive down the cost of practicing data science, right? It was, it's much cheaper to manufacture things automatically than it is to pay people to build things you know, in a painstaking, tedious way by hand. So if, if you guys can comment on your experiences with automation, uh, in modeling and financial services, uh, you know, or do you agree with this idea that we can automate data science processes and, and drive the cost down? Do you disagree? So I'll throw it, I'll throw it out to you guys. Yeah, I think from the, from the engineering side, automation is always great because that frees up our plate to actually be able to kind of go into that innovation space more. Um, especially the things that we tend to automate now are things that you don't want to be doing because they're things that you shouldn't have to be doing manually. So the, the more of those you can move off of your plate, uh, I think is always a better thing. Yeah, so for us, um, automation is key. So uh, there, there's a lot of emphasis on building models. I, I, I think that H2O with a uh, driverless AI has uh, solved for the automation of building models, but there's a lot more stuff to automate mm -hmm. in data science. There's a lot of automation that could be done in the data exploration, right? Uh, when, when, when do we build frequency versus uh, other type of analysis? Uh, there's a lot of automation to be done on the model deployment. Uh, how do we uh, build a wrapper around the Pojo so that it could be easily deployed? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of automation on the model governance. How, how can we um, document better the models? Right, so that it can go through procurement easier. And then there's a lot of automation uh, around how can you tell whether the model is performing or not. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of work. Yeah, yeah, there's <laughs> to be a lot done of work to do, yes, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll just build on that. I think um, one of the things that we've discovered through a recent um, model that we've released from production is there's there's a lot that goes with production, right? Like that you, you think, well, yeah, you're, gonna, you're gonna do your, your training and you're gonna come up with your model and you're gonna launch it and then you're gonna move on to the next project. And it's not at all like that. You've got um, ancillary stuff to make sure that the model is running smoothly and it's retrained and that, you know, in some cases you're alerting on it. And uh, so, you know, automation as a whole is key to scale so that mm -hmm. you can continue to build off of what you released before and continue to expand on that. and bring in more stuff. Yeah, and, and then just forgot to mention that I'll be speaking on automation tomorrow yeah. on those different pieces. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and all this kind of ties into the regulatory lens that sits very heavily in financial services. So what are your thoughts here about how, I mean, you know, machine learning is not new to the industry. Linear models are in place for many years and generally accepted. I think we see the same with tree-based models. But as we get into the more advanced techniques, what, what are your thoughts around the regulatory lens and the availability of transparency and, and what we need to do as an industry to make that available for our financial services customers. You guys need it? You guys don't. You guys, you guys figured it out for yourselves. Yeah, we'll, we'll, figure, <laughs> we'll, we'll figure it out, but I, 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 I think that's, if we look at trends and where things are going, that's definitely, uh, I hear more about it, I see more, uh, you know, I, I saw a number, I think it's about 30% uh, the financial services uh, industry is is using or actively deploying it, uh, machine models. So there's still a lot of a lot of area out there to grow. Um, a lot of companies are just thinking about it or testing it. So uh, so I see that just to continue to grow. But the regulatory uh, shift, I think, with the current administration and how that's uh, pulling back regulations, and it, you're going to see that change uh, and impact. I think uh, in the next year or so. Uh, um, and so, who knows what the landscape's gonna look like a year from now, okay. right? Yeah, so I think that the, the first step 
at least has started in that um, the AI model that Vantage Score has built is actually deployed right now. And that's where the algorithm was built with AI and then locked down. So it's still not in a black box and not an online, but um, it's the first step. I think the, the next step, I think, to help get them comfortable is to have the regulators working on AI projects themselves. And so, um, just thinking about this, if it, if it were me, I'd probably engage them with the Urban Institute or the um, Aspen Institute, something that is kind of a, a pseudo-government agency almost, and challenge them to um, evaluate some models that are being built or build their own or work with CFPB, OCC in order to help them understand it when they're doing something. Because like, like we've been talking about, I think the people understand it much better if they do it as opposed to learn about it. Sure. And so if they get their hands in it, I think that you have a better chance of cool. getting them to accept even H2O. So help demystify really it, what's it really, going on. In yeah, the it would. Yeah. Okay. yeah, and just to kind of add on that, I think, yeah, just early engagement and kind of making it more of a conversation than a, you know, look at this and throw it over the wall and, and let us know what it looks yeah. like right. uh, will help with that as well. Yeah, so, so one thing I often, like, tell customers that I know well is we can only help you with the technology part of this problem. We can't help you with the human part of the problem, which is oftentimes more than half of the problem now. So, go, so I just have something else. I, I think the, the angle is <coughs> accuracy. So you know like the FTC and when st studies have come out, they're, they're sometimes concerned with just the number of subprime or number of thin file and, and the disenfranchisement of some, con some consumers, but they really get up in arms about accuracy. And so if the proof is that AI um, results in more accurate assessment of consumer and people behaviors to predict what their future behaviors would be, then that they're reasonable people in that way. They're statisticians, they're economists. That might be the way to help get them over the line with that. Cool, okay. Right. I'll take some questions. Yeah, yeah. So, so we've got some questions up here on the screen, but um, I think it, we can try, you know, if people just want to raise their hand, or how do you want to do well, it, that's Wayne? That's how this is going. Uh, can we get the Slido uh, screen? Perfect. So go ahead and, and you guys can, uh, so the way they're ranked is uh, by how many likes we have. So the top one will be the most liked one. So you guys can go ahead and moderate how you guys see fit. Yeah, let's just start from the top. What are some of the best practices when building an ML platform when your data contains personally identifiable information? Strip off the PII. <laughs> <laughs> Get rid of it. Get rid of the personally identifiable information. Yeah. The PII or anything that looks like PII. So something that would have demographic, anything that looks demographic that could be tied back to someone's um, gender, age, ethnicity, because you want to make sure that you don't have something that could have been brought in that, um, that that's a protected class that could change the model, because you won't pass fair lending. Yes, so I'll say that in our world, um, as a uh, RESTful API, we receive real-time uh, PIIs, and then we return back a probability score of how risky and what are some of the risks. What we do in-house is that we keep PIIs completely separate. Sometimes we don't even store the PII. What should be going into your machine learning platform models are features that are built on top that uh, shows behavior of what you're trying to predict. It's not a PII. If you're using PIIs, I don't know whether the model itself is, is going to be answering the question you're looking for. Good point. So um, I like the idea of stripping PII off, and uh, that's what we try to do. But in the use case of fraud, where you need some of that data um, to, to really uh, do, do it right, uh, we like to control the data through uh, governance and who has access uh, at the user level, at the role level, and at the project level. So in the environment they're going to get access to it, it's temporary. Uh, it's tokenized and they're allowed to detokenize it for certain use cases and when it has to be. So I think from my perspective in a platform uh, view, it's controlled through that governance process uh, and management can control it. The, the access would expire uh, unless it's renewed uh, consciously. So I think those are ways we can prevent it, but it's only for those you know, approved use cases that need PII. Cool. Okay. 
that? I think with that as well, getting a little more fine grain with your control of the data. So, it, you know, if you have your team that might need that, they might not need the whole table or they might not need every single column. So being able to, to target a little more and then, um, you know, being able to revoke it when, it when they don't need it further just helps. User-based permissions exactly. type of thing. All right, let's, um, let's maybe take this blockchain question. So since blockchain is decentralized and the owner of, of a transaction is hidden, how can it help reduce fraud cases that uh, financial services is currently facing? Is that, yeah, I am think I reading that right? I'm trying to, yeah. yeah okay. I'm just doing as well as I can, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, I think that there are two parts to this question, right? And I think, you know, I want to answer it on both of these parts. The first part is that, you know, the Bitcoin blockchain is actually decentralized. Um, and the owner of transactions is simply known by their, you know, sort of public address. And this goes back to what I had said earlier where, you know, the exchanges that allow transactions in Bitcoin are actually money services businesses. And hence they are bound by the same KYC, the politically exposed persons, you know, the PEP screens uh, and the ML screens, et cetera. And what they do is they deploy machine learning algorithms to figure out whether this particular public address has interacted with another address on the dark web. Mm -hmm. um, interpreting what website is, can be classified as a dark web is where machine learning comes in. Um, so, you know, I think that, you know, you can almost see how machine learning can be applied to figure out whether this, uh, you know, transmitter of bitcoins is actually somebody who, you know, you shouldn't, you, you essentially need to control and have a SAR against. Um, on the other hand, when you talk about private permission ledgers, the owner of transactions is actually not hidden because private permission ledgers operate in an open ecosystem, which is kind of open to members within that ecosystem. So, you know, you don't have the problem that the Bitcoin blockchain does have, which is, you know, uh, the owner of transactions being hidden. So within private permission ledgers, this problem doesn't necessarily exist. Okay. Anybody else want to comment on that? All right. I'm, I'm going to mix it up a little bit. Um, Let's, let's do this hiring question. Can you talk about some of the challenges for financial firms hiring data scientists in a hot market? <coughs> so how are you guys, how are you guys able to, uh, to hire the talent that you need? Sure. Um, for uh, the, the hiring of, of data scientists are always going to be a, a challenge. But I, I, I believe that if you put together a cool product or you have some cool ideas that uh, data scientists are going to go after, you will get the right talent. And the reason is because it's not always about the compensation for data scientists. It's also about how, how interesting is the work that they're doing. And that will bring in the, 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 the right talent. The, the challenge that I have uh, in-house uh, in the hiring is more on we have a cool product. Uh, but then the majority of the talent out there is just to build models. And the talent I look for is how can we automate what data scientists are doing. <laughs> yeah. And so that, that, that is the uh, challenging house. Okay. We'll have to talk about driverless AI. Yeah. <laughs> we have this product. We can, we'll talk about it later. <laughs> so I guess my, my first thing is, is anybody looking for a job? <laughs> yeah. I, I can't keep people, I, I have people on the team and we are constantly hiring. We don't have a retention problem, we're just growing and we, we just bought a new data set from Clarity. And so we have an explosion of needs for data scientists and analysts. And so I'm actually thinking about the driverless AI because there are people that I want to promote the skills of internally and get them to the point that they're, that they're doing the AI component who are analysts right now. But in terms of throughput, it really is really hard to find mm -hmm. good talent. Um, I think that I think that the interesting projects is definitely one that attracts them, and then the other one that uh, I believe Experian has is, is a culture. And so a lot of people who have worked with us as lenders and clients before, and we're a really small community. Everybody kind of knows each other to some degree, maybe two degrees of separation, and um, it's a it's a nice culture. People ex are expected to behave a certain way and I think that it's some um, kind of laid back and, and people like it and so I think that that helps to attract them but honestly I don't think that there's enough right now I don't think that there are enough people that are um, skilled enough that that I can hire that's another reason we want to automate 
Yeah, I'd add to a uh, recommendation for, for the financial institutions to partner with uh, universities mm -hmm. and, and um, getting the talent right out of school and, and grooming and growing them there uh, seems to work pretty well. And, and when you do partner with those universities, giving them unique problems to help you solve uh, gets them engaged and gets them knowledgeable of, of the industry uh, coming right out of college. So I think that's a, another approach I would recommend uh, these, these guys to take. Thank you. I think uh, this problem definitely exists within data science and within blockchain. It's even more acute. Uh, one of the strategies that seems to be working, though, is to take you know exceptionally motivated individuals from within within the organization that have you know specific domain knowledge, um, and then sort of you know give them the training they actually need to be successful data scientists. I think that seems to have a more sustainable you know kind of pipeline uh, you know within it. So that's that's something that you know. I've seen work work really, really well. Okay, great, great. Any any other comments on that point? Okay, all right. So, the last question I'm going to ask is, um, what are your predictions for for 2018? Or, or is there something that, that you think the audience really needs to have on their radar for next year or the year after that? And we, we can are, we can go down the line, or we can somebody can just jump. Okay, yeah. All right, we're going. We'll start with you. Okay. Uh, <laughs> You know, I think what is happening, again, you know, my, my experience tends to kind of, you know, again, gravitate towards capital markets. But what's happening is, you know, there is fallout from things such as Brexit. And capital is flowing into sort of regions with manageable or lesser geopolitical risk. Uh, one of those is New York. It's seeing an incredible influx of capital. So as a result of that, you know, the banks are like, okay, what do we do with all of this money? You know, we need to now start building our capital intensive businesses, which we divested from for quite a while. And because we divested from it, we don't really have a machine learning, you know, team that actually knows how this business works or, you know, have deployed any new technology against it. So if you think about what is going to happen in 20, 2018 is, you know, historical capital intensive businesses like the futures clearing business or the prime business, these are all going to see a lot of activity. And you really don't have you know, these tools and technologies being deployed or have them deployed in these businesses. So it's going to basically be a notion of opportunity uh, you know, going into 2018 and beyond. Great insight. Thank you. So for our space, the, uh, the space of algorithmic, uh, algorithmic IT operations and just being able to, to give the people who are trying to solve from our side, you know, command center operations, more tools, more ways to solve problems. Um, we'll just improve customer experience. Uh, I know if there, you know, there's the talk, uh, there's that question about risk mitigation, offerings for customers, revenue optimization, and you can kind of wrap all those in by, you know, providing a better product, um, which you can't really provide if you don't um, have a stable base to it. So um, being able to kind of move into that AI ops space is, is one, could be one of the big things, I think. Interesting, okay. Both, I've never heard either of these before, so. You're blowing my mind. <laughs> Yeah, so what he said. Um, okay. That's fine. Yeah, so for technology operations, it's all about incident detection, incident prediction, avoidance, stuff like that. Um, there's elements of cybersecurity there. I think that's going to be, certainly is and will continue to be big. Cool. Okay. I'll say that uh, there's going to be a lot more automation. I, I think that automation is going to be key. Um, it's not necessarily that data scientists are not going to have a job. I think it's just going to allow data scientists to uh, start looking at data in a different way that they have been looking uh, at it for the past five years or so. I think once uh, the, the modeling and the different pieces that I mentioned earlier gets automated, we, we can start looking at data in a more cool way. Uh, give you an example that just came to mind, how, how can we uh, extract value out of open source online resumes for us to be able to detect fraud, right? right. And for us to be able to feature engineer better data and be able to improve our, our models in-house and, and in, in, in the whole financial institution. Okay. 30, 30 seconds for you, David. Yeah, real quick, the, uh, the, the one thing I touched on earlier, I, I think in 2018 we're going to see a, a shift in the regulatory uh, landscape and how that's going to impact uh, the requirements for things. And, and the other thing I would like, uh, the automation that we talked about is expanding the, the role and making people that may not be traditional data scientists a able to do some of the work that, um, that they couldn't do before. So uh, I see a lot of the software and, and technology driving that. Cool. Okay. 
seriously, three of the things that I had in mind were already said. <laughs> there, yeah, yeah. I mean, but if you want to add, or we can just close it off. Yeah, I, I really hope that um, it expands the availability of credit to people. I hope that it really um, increases that accuracy and that, um, I guess, the high side is that if people would have been denied credit because we had it wrong, that by getting it right with more accurate tools, then that's, that would be the win. Okay, cool. So that's all we have time for. We really appreciate you guys hanging around for the discussion, and we, of course, appreciate the panelists and all their uh, very insightful comments. So let's, let's give a round of applause, and we'll be done. <laughs>